Excuse me. I have no idea if this is working properly. Okay, I think it is though. Can anybody hear me? Someone says they can hear me, so I'm gonna assume that everything's working, and um, and that'll be great. So, uh, welcome to another live show, and it is Sunday morning uh, where I am, and it is 9 a.m. Uh, here in America, it is Father's Day, which is um, not a thing for me because I'm not a father, but I have a father, so I'll be seeing him later on, uh, and I have a father-in-law, I'll be seeing him as well. So. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't. Father, Father's Day is not a, a worldwide thing that I know of. <clears throat> My voice is a little messed up. I'm a little sunburned, <clears throat> and I'm a. Uh, I'm in. I'm in not the greatest shape today. Uh, for the last two days at work, I've had to go and shoot video and photo. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, I've had to go shoot vote, uh, video and photo at a big. Uh, music festival here in town for work so uh, quarter of a million people and uh, I was out there Friday and Saturday in the Sun running around lifting equipment shooting doing stuff whatever sunscreen it was it's been a long weekend and it's not over yet but uh, the shooting the, the, the work is done so this today is mainly this show and then um, some a lovely lunch and then later on dinner and family stuff and so that'll be kind of nice then I got to get some work done later tonight before tomorrow and then it's back at the work week let's see we've got a lot of people saying where they're coming from Shanghai China wow that's cool Norway Sweden Traverse City MI is that Michigan I think Michigan my wife says it's Michigan she's uh, let's see here San Antonio Texas um, Let's see here. We got all kinds of people coming in. Uh, rainy old Australia. Oh, I didn't realize that it was rainy there. Um, I saw somebody early on ask a question, which I was going to answer. Ron Dilly asked, um, "How does your friend that owns the uh, friendly local gaming store doing business-wise? My friendly local gaming store supplements by selling paintball equipment in the summer months. Um, he's doing pretty good. He's uh, he supplements by um, he does a pretty good eBay business." And he's looking into going into um, having his own just complete like live or not live, but like his own you know online store. Um, he's even though he he he's big into miniatures himself, he's also big into magic. Like he's been a competitive player in both. Um, so he's in a situation where you know he's very good at figuring out what are good singles, what the prices are for singles, you know, what singles he wants to invest in, things like that. So he buys and sells and all that stuff. So yeah, he's he's doing okay. I mean, everybody always wants to be doing better, but, you know, that's kind of the way it works. So uh, let's see here. Sweden, northern Germany, France, Poland. Morning from uh, the neighbor to the north. That would be people across the street. No, oh, that's south. Annie? Over there? Oh, I see. Probably Canada. My wife is giving me a face. Um, Northamshire, UK, Scotland. Yeah, it's very sunny here today, um, Scotland. I know it's overcast where you are. I was kind of expecting it was going to be kind of rainy or something, but it hasn't been. So it's been honestly quite hot, um, at least for us. Belgium, Southern California, Quebec, Lake Superior, uh, Bristol, Italy. Wow, awesome. Texas. All right, so... Um, Let's see what else has gone on since the last um, since the last show. Well, one thing that I ended up missing by not 
or by having to work yesterday was um, I missed uh, going to an event some friends of mine were putting on north of here probably about an hour and a half drive north and um, it was an infinity event um, so I was looking into I wanted to go just to check it out because I'm not playing infinity yet but I wanted to go and check it out and uh, but then I ended up having to work so um, I couldn't go but um, I guess they had about 10 people or maybe more um, Sam was there you know, friend of the show, painter Sam, and he, uh, he was there. His brother was there, and a bunch of other people that I know. And um, they, I saw some pictures on Facebook this morning. They seem to have had a good time. So uh, I'm glad that that went well. And I guess they're going to do another one eventually, and hopefully I can make it to that one. Because, um, like I said, I'm not playing um, yet, but I'm getting to the point where I'm going to probably start thinking more about it. And it's nice to have kind of events like that to be able to go to, especially to help and have a bunch of other people to help. You know learn and that kind of stuff so uh, Mia Thompson asks hey do you have any recommendations for anyone who has a low budget but would like to start playing Age of Sigmar this would be my first miniature war game but I already have the essential tools well um, my definite first tip would be to look at number one would be to look at um, one of those start collecting boxes they don't have a start collecting boxes Games Workshop doesn't have start collecting boxes for every army yet but they're getting there. I know there's a couple for death. There's, I know, an orc one. There's a, a chaos one or two. You know, if you want to get into the corn guys or the stormcast, then the starter box is really good for Age of Sigmar. And then maybe if you can split it with somebody else, or if you just want the stormcast and you don't want the corn guys so much, you can throw them on eBay and try to get some money back or whatever that way. Um, but otherwise, the start collecting boxes are really super good values. Um, if you're into lizard men, it's one of the best values. Like the lizard men box comes with a figure in it, which is an $85 figure, and the box itself costs $85. So everything else that's in the box is basically like thrown in for free. So yeah, the start collecting boxes or getting started or whatever they're called, they're they're really good. Um, $85 American. It's different in other places. Looks like 65 euros according to Peter Pan. So yeah, that's a good place to go. The other good place to go is, frankly, eBay. Um, you know, people are, some people got rid of their armies or they just, you know, because they didn't like the switch to over to Age of Sigmar or um, they're just not interested, you know, in playing anymore or they're getting out of stuff or they're moving to a different army or whatever. So eBay is always a good place to pick some of that stuff up. Uh, two of the figures, no, actually I take that back, three of the figures I'm going to show you this this morning that I'm working on uh, are, are from eBay, now that I come to think of it. So, um, yeah, so they're great value, and they come with the rules, which, well, I mean, they come with the rules for those sets, but you can get those online for free, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, yeah, it's really good stuff. It's, it's good. Uh, let's see here. Rusev... I can't even pronounce that first. Last name, Sandbags. I'm assuming that's a family name. Uh, hey, I'm driving through Milwaukee, Chicago, and Detroit next week for a road trip. Any recommendations on cool places to visit or eat at? Uh, well, I don't know those cities super well. I've never been to Detroit. been to Chicago. I've been to Milwaukee, obviously. Milwaukee's not super far away from me. It's about 100 miles away. Um, hmm. Not great recommendations. There used to be this great restaurant in Milwaukee that I loved that was called the Africa Hut and it was um, basically kind of Ethiopian food and used to love going there but that place uh, those people retired actually I guess probably about five years ago so um, we don't we don't go there anymore. Gen Con the big you know American uh, tabletop gaming convention used to be in Milwaukee for years and years and years so we would go down to Milwaukee go to Gen Con and then usually go to, to dinner at, at Africa Hut but now it's in Indianapolis. That's a much longer drive. So, yeah. Um, painting my new Eldar army today. What do you think about the new Eldar start collecting boxes coming this week? Oh, I hadn't even heard that there were Eldar start collecting boxes coming this week. That's cool. The start collecting boxes seem to be... They seem to have put a lot more into them uh, on the 40k side than on the, um, the Age of Sigmar side at this point. But I suspect that that'll probably change over time, so... Hello from France, Amber Lion. Um, okay, Sparrowsworth says, we have some great places in Ann Arbor. So Ann Arbor is in the same state as um, Detroit. I'm not great on my Michigan geography. So I'm not, I know Detroit's in the lower mm, southeast, I think. 
Um, Ann Arbor is not super far away, but you know everything in America is kind of far away from everything else in comparison. Uh, let's see here. Are there any other YouTube channels that watch that probably that I watch? I'm assuming as you're asking uh, on a regular basis. Um, I like the Andy and Rem show on Andy Two D Six's channel. I've been on it a couple of times. Um, they do good work. Let's see. Um, I'm in this group called the uh, Wargamers Consortium, and that is uh, a group. It's an ad hoc kind of network of different YouTubing wargamers, wargaming YouTubers, whatever. And um, yeah, so uh, there's a bunch of people in that group. Um, the main channel is called WS WG Consortium, if you look for it up on, uh, on um, YouTube. But there's a bunch of other people that are in that group. I mean, I watch mini wargaming from time to time. I watch um, Gorilla Miniatures games. Ash Barker, I watch him from time to time. Um, currently wearing a Wargamer Girl t-shirt. Uh, so yeah, I've obviously, you know, uh, which I've now stretched out. Um, I obviously, you know, watch her stuff from time to time, even though I don't really play um, War Machine. The, her battle reports are really really well done so I always like to look I, I like to watch those pretty frequently so so yeah um, sandbags is asking would you ever go to mini wargaming I have looked at flights um, I would need to fly to Buffalo New York and then drive across the border to Welland which is where they're based out of so I, I would love to kind of visit and do a bat rap or do something with them. I think that would be kind of cool. I've, I've kicked around the idea. Um, I'm going to be at Valhalla in Utah in October, and at the very least, I know Chris from Mini Wargaming is going to be there, and I think Dave might be as well, but I'm not sure on that. Um, and so I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll bring it up some more there. It's it's with the traveling to Utah for Valhalla. I don't know that I'm going to have a lot of you know, discretionary extra money to be also flying to Buffalo and doing stuff like that. And you don't want to go to Buffalo, in my opinion, in the winter because it's it's in this weird geographical spot where it gets snowed on like crazy. So I don't know. I want to fly into that Buffalo in the winter. So I don't know. Maybe next year. But I would. I think it would be fun. It'd be kind of cool. I like those guys. Um, let's see here. The start collecting Chaos Demons box are pretty good deals for both AOS and 40k. No, that's true. I mean, that's one of the benefits if you decided. That's like the only army, if you wanted to go Chaos Demons, you could start out, start playing, um, you know, uh, Age of Sigmar and go through all of that. And then if you decided at some point, you know, I really want to start playing 40k, then you could just start playing 40k with the same figures. Which, back in the day, you kind of couldn't because it was square bases versus round. There were ways around it, obviously. Some people magnetized and whatever. But nowadays, it's just so easy that you can start out. It's weird that it's the only army you can do that with. Um... And I guess if you modeled them and you did some magnetizing, you could maybe do it with orcs a little bit, but I don't know. Matthew Jarnett says he lives in Buffalo. Well, hello. Um, from what I understand, it snows there a lot sometimes. A couple of years ago, it was 18 feet of snow or something crazy like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad to see that you made it through. Um, any chance we could get either you or Sam to show us how to how to do a really nice cleanup of a showcase mini? Uh, well, not me, probably. It would most likely be Sam. Sam's the showcase painter. Um, yeah, maybe. I, I, I can Actually, Sam and I are going to be shooting two new episodes, well, one or two new episodes on Tuesday, and then you'll see them on the channel eventually. Um, we get together and usually try to shoot a couple episodes together at, at a time, so that it's just, you know, it's just a better use of time versus, because he lives about a half hour away. So for him to drive in, just do one episode, it makes more sense to do a couple, and then, you know, it just makes more sense. So yeah, um, yeah, I'll mention it to him, definitely, though. Like a cleanup, you know what I mean? Like getting, you know, like completely obliterating mold lines and joins and pits and any kind of stuff like that because you're going to be using it in, you know, something needs to be judged. I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Um, let's see here. Like how to clean mold lines around fingers and hair. Yeah, no, that is really hard. Anytime that there's uh, uh, there's a model I'm working on in the basement right now, it's an older metal model, and he's for my Chaos Army. Uh, he's the Lord of Plagues on Demonic Mount, or something like that. And uh, 
his horse's mane has got a mold line running all the way across the top, like one side of it kind of, and I'm just like, why do they do that? So I'm trying to clean it up as best I can, but I'm not, again, I'm not a showcase painter, so that's that doesn't work out for me, but uh, let's see here. The point system will make AOS play like classic Warhammer Fantasy, but you don't uh, have to play with points. Um, well, I mean, not class. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be as detailed as, as Warhammer Fantasy was, but you will at least be able to say, okay, well, these are points, and we can agree ahead of time to do X amount of points and then get together, as opposed to doing that I place and you place and I place and you place kind of a situation. So, um, yeah. Let's see here. Mr. Porcio says, Hi, Adam. I recently joined the Legions of Death by starting a vampire army. Your skeletons inspired me. Oh, well, great. Uh, I, I've been enjoy enjoying them. I've got at least 50 of them in the basement right now that are primed bone color. And I'm going to be doing that thing that if you watch the video about how the quick and easy way to paint skeletons, I'm going to be doing that with all of those skeletons starting very soon. Um, I don't know if I'm going to take a break first and do these guys that I'm going to show you in a little bit. That's kind of the subject of today's video um, or live show, whatever. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of getting those guys done. So let's see here. So uh, Mia Thompson's asking, but what are points? How would you use them? Well, basically, points in miniatures games usually you will, you know, the, the the company that makes the miniatures games will come up with points for each miniature. This miniature is a 12-point miniature. This miniature is maybe a 20-point miniature. And it's dependent upon, generally, how effective it is in a battle. Things that are less effective in a battle have lower points. Things that are more effective in a battle have higher points. The idea is that then you, as a player, you and your friend get together and say, okay, we're going to play a 200-point battle, just for the sake of the argument. And then you build your list, so you have 200 points worth of you know models, and then your opponent has 200 points worth of models. And then when you come together, in theory, your models should be your, your armies should be balanced. They should be the same amount of power. That rarely ever is 100% the case. There's almost no game in history where the points are perfectly balanced. There's always a little bit here and there, but the idea is that you at least have a target to shoot for. The way Age of Sigmar works currently is that you just basically, you kind of bring out stuff, like you bring your army, and then you and your opponent, like you go, okay, well, I'm going to bring the, this unit of guys. And then your opponent says, okay, well, I'm going to bring this unit of guys. And you just keep going back and forth until one of you is like, well, I'm not going to bring any more guys to the table. And then your opponent has to make a judgment call and see, do I want to keep placing more units? If you go a certain number over your opponent in models, then your opponent gets sudden death benefits. So if I have 30 models and you bring 50, you have a third more than I do, at least. And then because I'm now outnumbered, I get some extra benefits that can help me win the game. So because I'm outnumbered. So um, it, it's all in the rules, but that's the way the current game works. Um, in the General's Handbook that's coming out this summer, there's going to be optional points where instead of saying that this guy is just a guy, they can be like, well, this guy is, you know, 75 points. And then whereas a normal foot slog soldier might only be 12 points or whatever the deal might be. So let's see here. Do, 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 do. Can people send you mail swag? Um, I've thought about that, Daniel. I haven't come up with a good idea like you know like an address and stuff but I'll, I'll look into it I've been thinking about it um, and then I could do unboxings of things that I get in the mail I suppose that'd be interesting um, let's see here do, 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 do. summoning needs to be talked before the game uh, the, the whole game I mean Age of Sigmar in general I think one of the reasons I don't think it works super great for tournaments obviously is because you do need to have some conversations before the game. You need to have some conversations about like how big of a game, how long do you want to play, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to bring this, you're going to bring this, and back and forth. And another thing is sometimes summoning. I have never had super big trouble with summoning. Um, normally in the games that I've played, summoning has just been designed to sometimes bring back units that have already been killed off. Like, oh, these guys got killed off already. Well, now I'll just bring them back. But, of course, they, end, they generally end up coming in kind of further back at the end of the table, and it takes them a while to get back into the fight and stuff. So sometimes they don't come into that big of a deal. You know, if you bring 
a ton of models to summon and on the first turn you're just like cranking out stuff all over the place and now you have five times the number of um of models that your opponent does the trick about the game, and this is the thing that I think people overlook, let's say I started with 25 models on the table, and you started with, I don't know, 30. So there was no sudden death. We were relatively equal in number of models. Strength and all that other stuff doesn't matter at this point. I have 25 models. On the first turn, I summon another 50 models, let's say, okay? So I've got 50 models, now 75, right? Because I added 25 to start, and now I've added 50. As my opponent, all you have to do is kill 25 models, not necessarily my original 25. You have to kill 25 models, and then you win because you killed. That's the way it says in the rules. From what I understand is that if you kill the number of starting figures, it doesn't have to be the starting figures, it just has to be the same number of starting figures, you win. So if I decide to throw out a bunch of skeletons, you know, and just spam skeletons and do lots of summoning, that's great, but if you chew through them all, then I still will lose. Now, if I decide to summon 15 demon princes, well, then maybe you should think about not playing that guy anymore, because that guy's kind of a jerk. You know what I mean? It's just sort of the, I mean, yeah, it's legal to some degree, if you pull it off right, but it's not, I don't know, I don't think it's a good way to play, and so at the very least, you and your opponent should talk about summoning, whether you want to use it, whether you don't. There's no reason, there's no law that says you have to. It's your game. You know what I mean? So, um, someone also says same with shooting into combat. In the rules it says, it doesn't say you can't shoot into combat, but it also doesn't say you can't. You can. It's just, it doesn't say you can't. So people generally allow it. Um, but if you and your opponent don't think it's cool, well then that's cool. Don't play it that way. You know, it's, that's one of the things I like about the game is it's very, you know, you, you, it's very different depending on who you play against and you can kind of make your own, I don't want to say make your own rules, but you can kind of set your own house rules and do all that stuff. So again, which is why it's not great for tournaments. So let's see here. Um, let's see, do to do, do Silver Tower people. Hi Adam, is there much of a wargamer stigma in the US? Having lived in the UK for most of my life, I can say that here in Sweden, nerd culture is actually really celebrated comparatively speaking. Um, it's interesting. Probably three years ago, I was at Gen Con, or four, or I don't know, a couple years back, sometime in the, in, the, in the not too long future or past, I was at Gen Con in Indianapolis. Gen Con is, um, it's about 65,000 people these days, and it's not just wargaming, it's all kinds of tabletop gaming, so it's, you know, Magic the Gathering, it's, um, what else? Uh, you know, I mean, RPGs, also tabletop stuff, board gaming, all that jazz. Uh, Gen Con's very cool. Uh, but it's getting humongous, partially because of nerd culture in, in America and things like that, and uh, the popularity of that kind of stuff. So I was there, and I was at the hotel, and it was breakfast, and there was like a thing down in the basement, not in the basement, in the lobby, you know, where you go down, and it's continental breakfast, free breakfast for people who are in the hotel. So it, it was packed with nerds who were all eating omelets and stuff like that. And um, so I'm sitting at a table, and there was an empty space, and a guy came over and asked if he could sit there. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And he was from the UK, and we started up a conversation, and I asked him, you know, what he thought. This was his first Gen Con and all that kind of stuff, and I asked him what he thought. And he said to me at the time, he said he was amazed at how accepting everybody was of gamers in, in the local area. And I said, well, I don't know what you mean. And he said, well, when we were coming in from the airport, he says there were billboards up saying, welcome to Gen Con. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, and all the restaurants around this area, they all have giant signs in the window that say, welcome to Gen Con. And they have, like, the, the waiters are wearing, like, costumes and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of the way it works. And he said, in the UK, that's not the case. He says, if you have a gaming convention, none of the restaurants generally have stuff, you know, signs in the window and things like that. And he's like, it's just it's just not accepted the same way in the UK. And this was what he was saying. I, again, you know, maybe he it was wrong, but this is what he was saying to me, and I was kind of stunned by it because I guess in America, it's just like, well, if I'm a restaurant and there's going to be, you know, 65,000 gamers in town, of course I'm going to put a sign in the window that says, hey, gamers, why don't you come in here and get some food? You know, I mean, it just does, it makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I need to talk to more people from the UK and find out why that discrepancy is and, and you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, 
yeah, so that's kind of interesting to me. But around here, there's not particularly any stigma. I mean, I suppose there's certain people who are like, well, that's kind of weird. But I mean, nowadays with like the Big Bang Theory and Star Wars and all the superhero movies and all that stuff, all that kind of nerdy stuff is not as nerdy as it used to be, you know. So I think it's I, I think it's a golden age to some degree for some of us. So that's cool. Uh, let's see here. Adam, thank you for getting me to start a Darth Army. I was planning to play 40k in one of the bigger tournaments in Sweden, but I got the AOS bug and started painting undead. I do enjoy the undead. I do enjoy painting them. Uh, I like, I just like skeletons. I don't know why, but I do. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do other questions. Alan says, first live stream, but always wanted to say thank you, Adam, for making paintings seem not intimidating enough that I found the confidence to start Warhammer. Warhammer. Well, great. I'm glad to hear that you started Warhammer. Um, it's, it's, there's very few things in life that are really daunting if you take them into smaller parts and you make them, you know, and you just kind of start working on them and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of the way it works. Uh, someone asked, how did you start out as a gaming channel? What was your thought process and how did you begin to make videos? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so years and years ago, in 2010, um, Beasts of War did a video about Gen Con. And Beasts of War had just started their new website. So being a website guy, like in my day job kind of, they were like talking about new changes to the website and things like that and Gen Con. So I watched the video and I said, oh, that's very interesting. And at the end of the video, they didn't say that they were going to Gen Con. They just asked if anybody who was watching the video was going to Gen Con. And like, you know, hey, if you're going to Gen Con, post in the comments. So I said something like, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to Gen Con. I go nearly every year and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And then I went to bed because it was like midnight. And then in the morning when I woke up, I had a message in YouTube or whatever, because I think it was a YouTube comment, saying, hey, uh, you're going to Gen Con. Do you have a camera that shoots HD and a microphone? And would you want to talk to people there and do kinds of stuff like that? So that's kind of how I started working for Beasts of War. I was the US correspondent for Beasts of War um, from 2010 till end of 2012. So I went to Gen Con, I went to Adepticon, I did some videos downstairs in the basement a long time ago, like unboxings and stuff like that. If you look back to like the 2010, 2012 area on Beasts of War, you'll find some of my videos. Um, so I was doing that for them for a while. And then I decided that I wanted to just start my own channel. So I thought it would be a conflict of interest if I was really like doing my own channel, but also doing stuff for them. So that's when I stopped working for them. Um, great guys, I love I love the videos. Um, you know, they've got great production quality, and that was partially what drove me to try to do the stuff that I'm doing um, with my channel. And I've always been kind of a, a, a video, you know, filmmaking nerd anyway, so I kind of did that stuff. Um, I think that it's, for me, it was a situation of I wanted to teach myself more about video production. And I've said this a bunch of times before, I always have thought that if you want to learn a new skill, you need to apply it to a hobby because then it will make you want to learn it more and make you want to do it more. Like when you're a kid, they give you crayons and a piece of paper in art class and they tell you to draw and you're like, oh, I don't know what to draw. So, um, you know, in this situation, I wouldn't have known what to make videos about. So I started making videos about the stuff that I like to do, the nerd stuff. So, so yeah, that's basically what I've been doing. And, uh, I kind of did it on and off, you know, there would be, oh, maybe three weeks I wouldn't have a video, and then maybe, you know, I'd have two videos in one week, and it was back and forth and that kind of stuff. And then back in October of 2015, I decided I need to start doing it every week. Um, consistency is key in, in helping with, you know, um, furthering yourself, at least in YouTube. And so um, I've been doing that, and uh, it's really helped take off. I mean, two and a half years it took me to get to 10,000 subscribers. And once I started doing them weekly, uh, it took me eight months to get to 20,000 subscribers. And I'm at 23 something right now. So hopefully by the end of the year, I'll be at 30,000. So that'll be cool. Um, but yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a lot of work, you know, but I'm enjoying it. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, we'll see where it goes, but I, I do enjoy doing it. And I enjoy talking to all you people. And I enjoy getting people into the hobby. And when people tell me that, you know, they started playing War Machine or Warhammer or doing whatever that's hobby related this way because they were watching some of the videos, I really, I really dig that. So that's cool. Uh, Mia Thompson asks, what is Gen Con? Gen Con is the biggest uh, tabletop gaming convention in America. It's about 65,000 people. It's usually in August and it's four days in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
Uh, it's probably 40 years old. It used to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Before that, it, it started in Wisconsin. Um, but yeah, it's it started in a city. The reason it's called Gen Con is it started in a city called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And the Geneva Convention for World War II and whatnot was in Lake Geneva, Switzerland? I'm not great with that. Um, so because they were all war gamers, and back then it was mostly historical war gaming, the fact that they were in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and so they called it the Geneva Convention when it first started, and then eventually it got shortened to Gen Con. So that's where it started at. Uh, Adam, how do you conquer the fear of using green stuff to sculpt custom pieces to add on to a model? I saw you use the liquid green stuff to add texture to that wraith-like model, or do you not use it? I use G green stuff very sparingly. I do not use it to sculpt too much. I use it more often than not to stick things together, maybe to fill some things in. Um, actually, let me switch over to here. Da, 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 da. Hey everybody, I'm in this little picture up here. So this is one of the guys I'm going to show you today. This is one of my, un, my this is uh, Krell, the Lord of Undeath. Now I bought this guy on eBay and uh, it said in the listing on eBay that he was plastic, which was a lie. He is fine cast, which is resin and not plastic. And it's he's not a great model because of it. Um, now, if you've ever, if you're familiar with this model, you'll notice that that axe is not the axe he normally comes with. He normally comes with this kind of weird-looking two-headed, you know, two-bladed axe. But it was so bent because it was fine cast that I decided to just cut it off right above his fist right here. And then this axe is actually a plastic axe from the Putrid Blight King's kit. One of the things that's awesome about that Putrid Blight King's kit is that it comes with so much extra stuff. Like you can build five guys, that's it. But they can be built so many different ways and they come with so much extra junk that you can use in lots of situations. So because his axe and the axe handle part down here was already pretty bent, I thought putting a bent axe on him would just look cool. And I think it turned out pretty well. Now, I'm telling you all of this because up here, it's like kind of he's got like wrapping around the, the, the handle of his um, axe handle, like some sort of leather wrapping. So I had to try to mimic it with green stuff down below his fist because the original axe that he had in Finecast did not have that same wrapping. That's the best sculpting I've ever done in green stuff and it's not great. So um, green stuff is a weird dark art and it's hard to learn. But uh, you know, if you can learn it, you can do some really amazing stuff with it. But um, yeah, it takes a lot of practice, a lot more than regular painting and things like that in my opinion. So let's see here. Um, do, do, do. Uh, Michael Evans says, I have a tip. Prime models in primary colors close to their desired color and then play the game with them. Then slowly start painting the odd group as you get time. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's one of the reasons. I mean, it also saves you a step. If you use your, if you kind of prime in the color that's closest to what you need to be using for that model, it just helps kind of go through in that. This is what I'm doing here is a little bit different, and I'll be talking about that in a sec, but yeah. Let's see here. Uh, Liam asks, is there any plan to do anything video-wise with the painting showcase content? There is, actually. Um, I went through May, and I pulled out certain images and saved them in a folder, and I want to probably do a, a kind of a short video and sort of show some of those images off. And I'm thinking about doing one a month, but we'll see how it goes. Um, obviously, that first month, there was a ton of stuff that was put in there, but there's still been pretty decent volume since um, it launched, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 de, de, de. Corvax says, it's scary expensive, sadly. Them hotels are ouch. I'm assuming you're talking about Gen Con. Yes, Gen Con is getting a lot more expensive. It's getting a lot more busy. And yeah, the hotels, especially if you want to be anywhere near downtown, are super crazy expensive. So one of the reasons I'm not going this year is just because it's pretty expensive. I went last year. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time off from Gen Con, so yeah. Let's see here. eBay is always lying to you, but it does have good deals. Well, I don't usually have bad luck with um, with eBay. You know, and I guess the guy who was selling it, because it was already primed, you know, he said, oh, it's plastic because it obviously wasn't metal, but he didn't realize it was fine cast, I guess. Maybe the guy who was selling it isn't really a modeler. I don't know. Hard to tell. But, um, yeah. 
let's see here. I'm going to start painting my warp lightning cannon. This show is nice to have in the background. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that you're painting that stuff. I built the alternate build to the warp lightning cannon, which is the plague claw, plague claw catapult, which is built, primed, and base coated and kind of ready to go on from there. So it's currently sitting down next to all my skeletons in the basement. Let's see here. Um, do 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 do. Uh, I went back to buying and painting Warhammer Fantasy Battles after I accidentally saw one of your videos. Well, um, I'm sorry, I guess, but, you know, I, I, I like to get back, people back into the hobby, so that's, that's not too bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's see here. Has anyone heard if Games Workshop is going to bring Tomb Kings back for Age of Sigmar? I don't think anyone's heard... Um, I have a suspicion they may release new Death Army stuff that might be Tomb King-ish, but I don't know. The fact of the matter is you can still all use all your old Tomb King stuff if you want to, um, which I like. I'm glad that they did that as a, you know, just as a general course. I'm glad that they decided, hey, you know, we're going to do this, and, and, you know, just because we stopped selling this particular and stopped producing these models, you can still play them. You know, we still have all the War Scrolls for them, and I think that's really cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, Two Cents Ren says hello from Vietnam. Oh, well, hello. <clears throat> All right, so the subject of today's videos is currently kind of on the screen. You're looking at them from a bird's eye view. And it's um, three hero characters that I'm currently working on for my death army. Now, you will notice that they look like they're black and white because they kind of are. So... Those of you who have been watching my videos for a while, not just the live ones, but like the other ones, have maybe seen a video that I did that was pretty popular called Understanding Underpainting. These models are underpainted and not currently in focus. So um, basically the concept is, this is what I like to do with a lot, of, a lot of models. Like with the skeletons that I'm doing in the basement, I'm just spray painting them all bone color, that Krylon camouflage, like deserty color. And then I'm going to go from there because, again, there's so many of them. I'm not going to go through and, like, fancy highlight each of them. But with, like, hero-type characters like this, then, yeah, you do want to kind of do that. So um, what I did is I first, you know, I so I, I built them. Um, you'll notice here, for those of you who have watched the Real Use for Liquid Green Stuff video, you'll see that this guy's cloak is very textured. So what I did there for the texture, and I did it on his cloak, I did it on the Tomb Banshee's skirt, I guess you would say. If I can get it to focus or not, whatever, I was pretty close. Um, and I also even did it a bit on Krell's, um, you know, cloak. Like the furry bit up here was already there, but the cloak itself. Basically what I did is I used Liquid Green Stuff, which is a product from Games Workshop, comes in a little pot like paint. And, um, and then I used a toothpick, which overseas is called a cocktail stick, I think. And uh, they usually come to a very t uh, sharp point, and I clipped part of the point off so it was more just a flat end. And then I would dip it in the green stuff, and then I would just poke it, poke, 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 and kind of poke and spread around the green stuff to cover all of the, the, the smooth plastic. Because, again, these guys are undead, right? So why, I mean, they're made out of plastic, so the, the material of their outfits is very smooth, but I want it to be more grungy. Like, I'm not going to paint them ethereal. I'm not going to paint them green and ghostly. I'm going to paint them like more solid apparitions. There we go. Oh, look at that. There we go. So you can see the texture there. That focus worked way better. Um, so yeah, like you can really see the texture that goes on there. And, and just when it gets time to actually start painting and like dry brushing and doing things like that, I think it's going to work super well. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of texture that I'm getting on the cloak um, on, on this is the White King, his name is, with that's his mournful bl tomb blade or I don't know, it's something like that. And then again, here's Krell. And you can see the bumpiness and the, the texture that I've added to his cloak, just because I like the way that that looks. I think it works out really nicely. Um, so the liquid green stuff is kind of step one in this process, you know. And then you can see here I did a lot of work on his basing. He came on on like a, I don't know, I think he came on a square base maybe. Um, 
you know, that was plastic. So I clipped him off of that and I glued him onto a base that I've done with chunks of um, cork and stuff like that. You can see I put like a spear that was stuck in the ground. It's got a little flag on it. There's an extra little skull that I found. Um, you know, so he's ready to go. Uh, one of these two points actually here on his back, one of them is a toothpick because it was broken off when I got him, so I had to modify him. Um, this guy here, he came with a like a built-in base, again, that was square because he was a fantasy model originally. So I clipped all that away and then basically did a lot of cork and junk and all kinds of texture around him so it looks like he's standing in a muddy kind of you know uh, beat up kind of battlefield and I'm gonna paint it to be dark you know and, and kind of stuff like that and there may be a little bit of tuft grass here and there but not like a nice green field I'm not gonna do that and then here with her base again we've got you can see a skull in there um, Integrated into her original base, there was some rock, like she's just barely touching the ground there, like she's kind of floating along the ground, and that's what's holding her up. So it was integrated into the base, so you can see like rocks that she was sort of sliding across, and then I just added in extra grit and all that jazz there. Um, it's a big piece of kind of cork sticking up over here, as you can see. Um, yeah, so once they were all built and the textures and all that stuff, then it was priming. So I primed them with my airbrush, primed them black with a Vallejo airbrush primer. It's called B Vallejo, which starts with a V as in Victor. Uh, Vallejo um, airbrush surface primer, I think is what it's called. And uh, I, like, I like that stuff a lot for priming. I like to prime outside sometimes, and I like to use Krylon for certain things as well. But um, for most things, especially if it's winter and it's terrible outside, I need to prime in the house, and then I use my airbrush, and then I generally use Vallejo. Um, I do own some Badger Steinol Res primer, but I haven't used it nearly as much. Um, I don't know why. I just I, I I I think it's probably partially like I'm like well once I run out of Vallejo then I'll maybe switch over to the Badger but I need to test it before I get to that point just so that I make sure everything's cool. Um, so yeah, step one is after they're all textured and built and the bases and all that stuff's ready to go, then I prime it black. So these guys would be completely and totally black. Then I take either a white or a light gray. I have both. Um, a white Vallejo airbrush surface primer or a light gray uh, Vallejo surface primer. I own both of those. I take those with my airbrush and I start basically dusting it from the angle that you're seeing now. I start spraying straight down. This is my finger pointing straight down. So I, I spray. What you're trying to do there is you're trying to mimic the light hitting them from above. Okay. Um, so you, you, you're spraying from above, and it's like the light, the sun, or whatever is hitting them from, maybe it's the moon, because these guys are undead, and it's hitting them from above, and then you, so you spray, okay, so here's the model, this is difficult, and you're spraying straight down on top of the model. Then you start sort of spraying kind of at like a, so now you're trying to spray it like a, maybe as much as a 45 degree angle. If this is 90, okay, straight above the model, and 45 is like here, you might spray as low as 45. Now what you'll notice that that does, do you see, come on, focus, you jerk. It was focusing, there we go. So you see that shadow that is uh, like behind the, the ax, that's, just paint. I mean, there's a little bit of actual shadow there too, but what you're doing in this underpainting is you are mimicking and enhancing the shadows that would normally be on the model. If I just painted this entire model black and then I just started painting over it, I can do that. That's fine. But when I put this underpainting underneath it, it puts highlights in certain areas that would normally be hopefully high lit by, you know, the sun or whatever, any kind of light source. If you're playing in a store, there's probably you know lighting above you or whatever. Um, so you're kind of mimicking that. Now, there are two minds to doing this. You'll notice I also did it here on his cloak. Like the, It's hitting above, but it's starting to get darker as it goes down. And same with the, the Banshee. There are two minds to doing this. One of the reasons you do this is because you... Um, for some people... 
the visual of seeing, okay, well, there's a lot of white on top here. I should highlight more here. Oh, there's more, you know, white up here on the shoulder pad. I should highlight there. It just helps them as a guide for their painting. They are painting over all of this with a generally more opaque paint. And so it's just more of a visual guide. You look at it and go, okay, cool. I know where the highlights are and where the highlights aren't. And now I'll paint based off of that. That's not generally how I do it. Generally, the reason that I do this pre-shading like this, which is another name for, for underpainting, one of the reasons I do this is because then I go back, my first step after I get done with this to start painting is I use, I don't use normal paints, I use glazes. Now a glaze is different from a wash. A wash, we're all familiar with like the Games Workshop washes, Nuln Oil, uh, the brown one, the sepia one, I can't think of all the full names. Agrax Earthshade, is that still a thing? Anyway, um, so you take those colors, right? Uh, those as are washes, and if you put them on something, you cover the color, it darkens the color a little bit, but the majority of the wash goes inside like the crevices and then adds more detail. A glaze is a bit thicker than that, and it is designed to not go into the crevices as much. It's designed to kind of color the um, the flat parts, all, not equally, but color, but it's still transparent enough. So, um, one of the best glazes out there, in my opinion, are the Secret Weapon Miniatures washes. Secret Weapon is a company that mainly is known for making resin um, bases, like with all kinds of cool textures, and they have sets and all different sizes and all that stuff. But they also make these things called that they call washes that are really technically glazes, and I'm going to do a video about them soon. Um, but the trick is, is that if you use those glazes over the top of, let's say, this cloak, if I use, let's say, if I decided I wanted him to be imperial and have a purple cloak, I would use the purple glaze over there, and then it would look as if I wet blended um, light purple down to dark purple, because it's almost like you're putting like a color filter over this black and white. You know, like back in the day, um, when they were colorizing black and white photos, the way they did it is they took the black and white photo and then they used transparent paints to paint skin tone all over your face and then the dark parts, or the light parts here, would stay light pink, uh, if you were a, a Caucasian, and the dark parts would be dark pink. And they wouldn't have to go through and paint like you would like an actual painting. They were basically just putting transparent colors over a black and white picture. That is the easiest description of for what I can say that what I'm doing here. It's like I've made this guy a black and white picture, and then I will use transparent paints to color him in. And then it will allow me to get these great fades and these great um, kind of variations and highlights and shadow without actually having to wet blend, which as we know from watching Sam's video is, is not as scary as we all sort of think, but it is still a little difficult. And he makes it look easy because that's what he does. But if you want to get around that, you can just do this. You can take these, um, these models, prime them black, highlight them from above with white or light gray, and then when you start putting your transparent glaze colors over it, it will look like you're a better painter than you are. If you look on the, if you look on my um, page for um, my my the, the channel page on YouTube, right for Tabletop Minions, the middle picture is uh, a bunch of post-apocalyptic guys. But if I remember correctly, over on the left side, there's a photo of my Warriors of Chaos, and it's a picture of their cloaks, like they're all facing away from the camera. That's exactly what I did there. I painted them all black, dusted them from above with white, and then that's just a green glaze laid over the top of that cloak, and then it looks like I went from light green to dark green. At the bottom, I dry brushed some gray to make it look like the dust and dirt had gotten on their cloaks, which I thought made an extra nice effect. But that's basically, in a nutshell, what you're doing in these situations. Now, you'll notice, like on Krell here, and on the, the White King, you'll notice I didn't paint his um, blade in that same way. That's because I'm going to paint the blade silver metallic. And silver metallic is a very opaque color, so uh, you know, underpainting under that doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, um, so that's basically the case. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. A real-time underpainting tutorial would be awesome, Adam. Um, well, 
that's kind of what I'm doing here to some degree without actually laying, you know, actual paint to a brush. But uh, I'm, I'm looking at doing something like that. When I probably do a thing talking about the secret weapon washes, I'm going to probably uh, maybe do a little bit of a, of, of a show and tell on that situation. Stuart Perry says, um, like the secret weapon washes, I'd say they're glazes. Uh, I would say that you are absolutely right, Stuart. As a matter of fact, uh, Justin, Mr. Justin, who runs the company, told me himself that Really, they were going to call them glazes, but they thought that people would not understand what that meant as much, so they thought they would call them washes, and then kind of more explain later on what a glaze does. Um, you know, just the fact that there are bright yellow washes from Secret Weapon you already just tells you, I mean, there's no such thing as a wash. Normally, washes are all dark colors, um, and glazes can be light colors and dark colors. But um, yeah, so that's that's really the trick to this type of painting style, is that you are pre-shading. You're basically making a black and white version of your model, and then, like I wanted her hand to be real bright, so I might do her skin like a real ghostly kind of blue or ghostly green. So I did a lot of airbrushing to like really highlight her scary hand, and I also wanted to get kind of this kind of glow effect back there on the back of her dress and I worked on her face to get like a scary glow effect there. But the rest of the parts I wanted to kind of keep a bit more dark. It's more dark down underneath, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then just putting thin transparent glaze colors over the top of this black and white is gonna make it look like I knew what I was doing as far as blending and all that highlighting and stuff. It's a good trick and you don't even have to do it with a airbrush if you don't want to. Um, with a little bit of practice, you can do it with like a black primer and a white primer in rattle can and just do it outside. It's going to take more work and it's not going to be as accurate. You can get a lot more accurate with an airbrush. But um, but yeah, so that's basically like these are my plans. I have not decided yet really what colors I'm going to go with with these guys. Like, I know you were nearly in focus for just a second there, dude. Come on. Um, but yeah, so I haven't decided on colors yet. Oh, come on. Seriously. Come on. But... Uh, like this guy definitely I want to make his his um I want to make his crown be very like maybe like a brassy color and then add a green patina to it probably his shield as well um I'm not sure what to do for his cloak yet maybe this is the guy that's got the purple cloak and then he's got like more grayish whitish um you know the fuzzy bits the furry bit up here on the on the mantle um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure it out, but that, I, that's that's part of the fun is that you can basically make these guys black and white and then kind of go from there and try to think. Now, the trick is is that if you lay down a purple glaze over the top, over the back of that cloak, and then you're like, nope, not purple. I think I want to go green. Well, good luck. You're going to probably have to strip it and start over because because of the transparent, you can't like lay down a color and then go, no, that's not the color. I'm going to put a different transparent over it because then they're just going to mix and that's going to look weird. So... Yeah, it's not like a normal color where if you were trying to do it opaque, you could throw down like, you know, a blue and then be like, mm, maybe a green and then just cover it up. That won't work as well in this situation. So, all right. Anyway, so these are the, the guys um, that I'm working on here for uh, my more heroes for my uh, death army. Let's, does anybody have any questions, maybe, about underpainting and all this stuff? But maybe, but I was probably talking too much. Um, I'm going to try scrolling back, which always breaks the chat window, but we'll see how it goes. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Let's go back here. Um... Derek says, first time watching live, I've recently realized how important underpainting shadows is while working on a couple great narlocks. Yeah, um, I would say that like underpainting is really, really helpful in a lot of these cool situations. It's, it's difficult to do on big units, like a lot of guys, like the skeletons, I probably wouldn't bother. Um, if I really wanted to, I could have gone by and dusted all those skeletons, maybe with like a white from above, so they are bone colored now. And I could have dusted them just with a real light white to kind of like bleach the top of their skulls and stuff like that. But I don't know if I'm going to go with that. I think I can probably do that. I'm going to do that more with dry brushing and less with, um, you know, spray. But that's just a personal preference. Um, let's see here. I hate that Vallejo prior, primer. After two weekends, I can still just rub it off with my finger. Well, that's weird. You may have not shook it up well enough. Um, that's the only thing I can think of because these guys have been primed and I can't rub this stuff off, you know, I mean, this, 
that doesn't that doesn't come off. I've never had that dusting problem with Vallejo airbrush primer. Um, that's that's interesting. Let's see here. Um, I also have a tendency to use a uh, a hair dryer, an old hair dryer that I got from a rummage sale, and I use that to blow on them after I get them done, and it dries them quicker. And I think the heat might cure them a little bit. I don't know. It might just be a placebo, but there it is. Um, let's see here. The, the Badger Steinle Res stuff, uh, I know a lot of people like it. Like I said, I don't have a ton of experience with it yet, although I do own some. I bought some at Adepticon, I don't know, three years ago. Um, and I've used it a little bit, but I haven't, I've haven't. i been sticking mainly with the Vallejo because it's what I know. Let's see here. Why would you want to sand plastic models? Um, yeah, exactly, Necronaut. Uh, probably because for seams and, and some flash. I wouldn't necessarily, I don't generally use a sanding paper. I usually use like an emery board. They make those little foam ones and they work pretty nice. Um, primer can reveal all sorts of imperfections on the surface. That's true. The trick about mold lines, which I've just discovered recently, is that if you're holding your model and you're like, oh, I don't see any mold lines this way, flip it the other way. Because if your light source is above, this way, you may not see the shadow coming from the mold line, but if you flip it the other way, all of a sudden it will leap out and be like, oh crap, there's one. So don't just hold them always the same way and go, nope, looks good. Flip them around, flip the model upside down, hold it under the light in different places, and you will see new mold lines, which you will not see until you've got it painted, and then you're like, oh crap, I missed that one. So that's a, tr a, a quick little tip for getting rid of mold lines. Don't just hold your models always the same way in the light, change their direction and move them around and new ones will pop out. You'll be amazed. Uh, let's see here. You might want a smoother surface. Da, da, da. Uh, bigger models like vehicles need more filling than minis. Um, yeah, it depends on the kit. Like the Rhino kit for Space Marines is getting kind of old and putting it together, there would be a lot of gaps. That's certainly true. Um, Let's see here. What other thoughts are people having live streaming? Uh, what are your thoughts on the people live streaming their painting process over on Twitch? I don't like Twitch. I mean, if you like Twitch, that's cool. I'm not a fan. One of the reasons I don't like Twitch is because, from what I understand, they only, like at certain times a day, like prime time, they only show the most popular Twitch streamers. And if you are a Twitch streamer who is not popular yet, they just don't show your stuff. Um, I read an article about that, and I kind of tried it out. I was streaming, not this, but I was streaming on my PlayStation. The Mad Max game had just came out. So there's just a button on the PlayStation controller. You hit it, and you set up your, strip, your, your Twitch username and password, and it just starts streaming. And you're like, oh, neat. So I was streaming um, the Twitch, you know, the, the, the Mad Max game. And I thought, well, nobody's watching. That's weird, because the game had just come out. I'm like, eventually, I thought somebody might start watching. So then I pulled out my phone and tried to watch my own stream, and it said there wasn't one. So I was like, well, that's not super useful. So um, in my mind, I'm sticking with YouTube Live. I like YouTube Live. I can do all kinds of cool things like this, and I can do this. And I was going to do, actually, some pictures of my cats, because I figure at some point one of them is going to start making a bunch of noise, and I'd be like, oh, that's this one, but I didn't do that. And right now they're being pretty quiet. So, so yeah, for me, Twitch I don't think is going to work, um, but I do like using YouTube Live. I, it's In my opinion, I like it a lot better. I've used Google Hangouts some, too, and it does not, uh, the quality is not as good as this, in my opinion. So, um, But that being said, I haven't been able to figure out a good way to make this where I can have another guest. Um, that doesn't like I could do it with Skype. There's a built-in Skype control in this, but then the person who's on Skype can't see me very well, and so and I don't know if you he can hear. It's I don't know. I'm still working on it. A wash shades, a glaze tints. That's art school talk, is what that is, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, Twisted Bishop. I went to school for that stuff, and yeah, those are the technical terms. Uh, let's see here. Do do do. do. Um, like the Bob Ross of mini painting. I hear that from time to time, and I appreciate it. I think it's a compliment. Have you ever used Daler Rowney FW Transparent inks? I have not yet, but if you've been watching the videos that Sam does, pretty much every time he picks up an ink out of an ink bottle and shows you an ink, it's an FW ink. So he uses those transparent inks quite a bit. I'm thinking about getting into it. I'm looking at specifically the sepia. I think that would be kind of cool. And I want to see how well it works if I airbrush it onto terrain. Because normal, like GW, um, 
wash, if you airbrush it, it's like you didn't do anything at all. So I do want to look into using some of the sepia inks for airbrushing terrain to kind of help darken things up, grunge things up, and I would probably go with that. I can get that FW ink stuff here in town, so that's also a benefit. But I've not used it in normal painting yet, though, no. Um, let's see here. I spent 12 hours last weekend doing this zenithal. Zenithal is another term for this where the you're basically putting in a fake light source. That's what zenithal, if you hear about it and stuff, that's what it is. It's the spraying from above to make that fake light source. Uh, Michael Evans says, I spent 12 hours last weekend doing the zenithal under pr painting primer on like six other people's models. Well, that's nice of you. I hope they gave you like lunch or something. I don't know. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to do it for every single model in your army unless you're, well, I mean, if you're playing a skirmish game where you've only got eight guys, well then sure. But if you're playing like a bigger game, you may not want to do it for every last foot soldier that you have in your in your forces. But for HQ units, it works great. Um, big models, like big kind of monstrous models, I think it works really well too. I don't know about eh, vehicles. Yeah, it can work pretty well in vehicles too if you're like playing a sci-fi type of game or whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, it, I know a lot of people who do it pretty frequently when they're playing like a skirmish. Like I did it for all of my... My two crews of Malifaux so far, I did this this way. Actually, if you watch the understanding underpainting video, the, like the, the thumbnail is one of my Malifaux crews. So in those, I did them black and white first and then just did the transparent glazes and stuff like that for nearly all the colors on those models. The only colors that weren't transparent glazes, I think, were some dry brushing and um, anything metallic. So if they had like a gun or anything like that, then those were done in, you know, in normal paints. But everything else was, was the, the secret weapon washes. Because I bought, at the time, secret weapons sold like a box kit that was, and I think there was like a 20% off coupon if at, at Adepticon. So I bought like, I don't know, it was like a hundred bucks, but I got all these dropper bottles with all these different colors. And um, they're, 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 I think they're great. So I like, I like working with them in these situations. Uh, da, da, da. I just picked up Andrea ink washes. Haven't tried them yet. Are they any good? I've not heard of Andrea ink washes, so I'm not sure. Uh, let's see here. Patrick Smiths. Would it be cool if I made a fur cloth for an Imperial Guard commander? Well, yeah, I think that you could totally sell the idea that the Imperial Guard commander at some point in his career killed, uh, uh, I don't know, some sort of big monster or, or a giant alien wolf or something like that and he wears the pelt as a as a trophy i think that'd be cool actually see i like personalizing my miniatures in those situations like that i think that's kind of cool so yeah definitely i think i think that'd be totally cool um if you've got an airbrush doing black gray white xenophil primer is really quick and easy honestly that's kind of true um this doesn't take super long i mean it takes a little bit of maybe practice sometimes but, you know, worse comes to worse, you can always go back over it with a little bit of black and then start the, the, the highlighting with the lighter color again, you know. But, yeah, it's, it's I, I think it's it's not super diff easy to do with a rattle can, especially if you're, like, outside or whatever and it's kind of windy. But you can still do this kind of stuff with it. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Where did you buy that camo Krylon paint? I've searched multiple stores, but I can't find it. Um... Let's see. Around here, in the Midwest, we have a, 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 a line of we have a, 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 a group of stores called Fleet Farm, and that's where I generally get it. You can also get it at Walmart. Although Walmart doesn't, there's six colors in the line. Walmart doesn't always carry all six, but sometimes they do. Um, so Walmart, I don't think that Lowe's does, and I don't know about Home Depot. We don't have a Home Depot in town, so I'm not sure about that. But like I said, uh, Walmart. Uh, Fleet Farm, um, that's generally where I've got it. I don't know if it's something you can buy online. I've never bought any rattle cans online, so I don't know if there's like a legal issue with that. Like they can't ship them through the mail. I mean, I'm assuming they must be able to. You could look on Amazon, I suppose, and just see from there. But that's the kind of luck that I've had. Um, let's see. What's your most favorite piece you've done? Like the one you're most proud of? Can we see it if it's not too much hassle? Uh, if I don't even at the top of my head right now know. It might be... Hmm, Uncle Tickles is probably one of my more favorite ones. And you've probably seen him on the video channel a couple of times. He's a big Chaos Terminator uh, champion, and he's got lightning claws. 
he's probably one of the best ones. He's downstairs in the basement right now, so I would be gone for three minutes probably looking for him, which would not make for great live stream. So, um, but yeah, if you look, I want to say that I've got pictures of him in a couple different places. And if you take a look around, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can remember to, to, to point him out someplace. Washes are really just a technique more than a product. Well, yes, you know, I mean, you can make your own washes. Um, the I found early on that just mixing a lot of paint and some water does not make a wash. Here's another quick pro tip. If you just decide I'm gonna make a wash by just thinning my paint a lot and then rubbing it all over the place, it will work great until that last moment, just before it completely dries, the surface tension in the flat areas, just as it's about to dry, the surface tension will suck pigment up out of the crevices and then leave these weird like high tide marks in the flat areas. Like if you were to put it on a shoulder pad for a for a space marine, let's say, you know, it would look great because it would get down in the crevice in between the lip and the flat part of the, sh the shoulder blade until just before it dried and then all of a sudden it would suck a bunch of it up and it would look weird and have like these rings. It's just so what you need to do to make a wash if you're going to make your own is you need water, you need um, obviously paint or whatever sort of pigment, and then you need something that will break the surface tension very easy. Some people will use like a future floor polish. There's tons of videos online where you can find out how to make your own washes, um, but that's that that's the extra little step to uh, making a wash is some sort of surface tension breaker basically. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Um, let's see. James Miller said, oh, geez, where'd he go? James Miller. Uh, he got his Krylon camo at Pep Boys. That's a nationwide car part place. So, yeah, you could do that too. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think I missed some stuff here. Uh, have you seen the new resin models by Awaken Realms, The Edge? Using your technique on them now. No, I've not heard of Awaken Realms, so I don't think I've seen that. Um, that's that's interesting. Let's see here. Do 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 do. Yeah, let's see, let's. Uh, hmm. Would you use liquid green stuff to repair those kinds of mold lines? Um, I don't know that. I mean, you could cover them, maybe. Uh, you know, if you were going to texture that area anyway, they would kind of hide. I mean, honestly. Um, on this guy here, the White King, luckily I think I did it good enough, well, and you can't see it because it's not friggin' focus, focus. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a split right there on the back of his cloak that you can't see because I covered it in enough textured liquid green stuff. Um, but yeah, these two halves of the cloak go together, and so there's a split. That That's really the main thing I was trying to hide. I was going to texture the cloak anyway, but the fact that I was trying to also hide that, it took a while but yeah that's one of the things you can do um, there's also a gap well, not a gap but there's a there's a split in the back of her thing here which I've mostly hidden with the liquid green stuff now if you were trying to make her still look smooth and get rid of that split that would be a considerably more difficult um, I have found so yeah anyway um, let's see here do, 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 do. Minotaur ghost tints are the bomb. You know, I own a small set of like, I don't know, nine of them, and I have i don't think I've ever used them. I tried using one once, and I was—I think I used it wrong, and it just got weird and sticky, so I maybe if not, didn't shake it up well enough myself. Um, let's see here. I use plastic BBs for pot agitators. That's a good idea. Um, I had a friend who used a, a jigsaw, like a tabletop you know, jigsaw, and he basically attached like a little arm to the thing that goes up and down that makes the blade go up and down, and then he just put like a like a pill bottle like this, and he like hot glued it to that, and then he would put his dropper bottles inside there, close the top, turn on the thing, and it would shake them super fast, and then he could shake up his paints really quickly, which was kind of cool, but you know it took a bit of work. But once he did it, he could shake up his paints really quickly, so that was sort of cool. Kind of reminds me of those things at the hardware store where you get your house paint shook up. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Just going to do that. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, 
What else have we got here? Hey guys, anyone knows when Games Workshop is releasing Elfs? Elfs. Um, from what I understand, sometime this summer, possibly late summer, the rumors going around is that's when the new AOS Elfs are supposed to be coming out. It's going to be a lot of like druidy kind of stuff like that. Not so much like high elves, more wood elf type things. Um, so that'll be interesting. I, I, my friend who owns the, the game store is kind of waiting a little bit because he wants to build a wood elf slash regular elf, high elf, whatever, army. And so he's waiting a little bit to see what drops um, when the new stuff comes out. And then he's going to kind of go from there. So yeah, probably summer-ish. Uh, Let's see here. Doo, 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 doo. Can't wait to try the Age of Sigmar point system, says Chris Dog. My game shop wants to do a league. Well, yeah, I mean, if you were going to do a league, that'd be the way to do it, because doing it, you know, trying to play a league without points, I think, would be difficult. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, like, I'm not particularly interested in the points for this particular game, but the fact that they're adding them so that more people will be interested and the people who want points will be able to have them, but the people who don't want points don't have to use them, I think that's a good plan on their part, so. Um, do I have to buy a starter kit, or can you start with just a few, says Tough Noogies. Uh, talking about Age of Sigmar. Yeah, you can start with just a few, kind of. You know, I mean, you really can. Um, the rules are free on the Games Workshop website. Plus, there's also an app that you can get for Android and for iOS that's free that has the rules, and you can download nearly any War Scroll, I think, that you're interested in. I mean, there are some in-app purchases, like if you wanted to buy the um, battle plans that come in certain books, rather than buying the book, you know, and having to carry around, you could just buy the access to the stuff that's in the book and that's cheaper than the print book so you can do that through the app but I haven't done that yet so yeah the app is kind of nice actually I I still generally print off the stuff that I'm going to use in a battle when I go to a battle just so I can get at it quicker um, but that's just my own personal preference uh, let's see here what's the minimum amount of time you wait between applying normal thin down acrylic paint layers hmm I normally paint in a kind of a, um, assembly line, so I have a tendency to, uh, you know, like I paint this guy, you know, paint his shield, and I paint this guy's 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 shield, and by that point maybe, well it's not that quick, but maybe it's a minute has gone by, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, and by the time I get back to the first guy, he's ready for the next step. So if you just work on one person at a time, in my mind it can slow things down, even if they're not all the same type of guy, like these units here, right? These are all three separate people, um, and they're going to have very different... Let me try to get them into the shot. They're all going to have very different things going on. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be work on his cloak, and then, you know, different color, and then work on her thing, and then work on his sword, and then just keep, you know, the metallics, I would work on the metallics at the same time, but other things you don't have to necessarily keep. Like, oh, well, I've got blue on him, so now I've got to put blue on her. You don't have to do that, but it, it helps to kind of work as you go because by the time you get through the, f the three, then the first one's, you know, ready to go. So, yeah. Let's see here. Where are we at? Okay. Hey, Adam, love the Sunday morning streams. Just picked up the Age of Sigmar starter box. Can't wait to get all these guys glued together and to start painting. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's been fun. Oh, uh, Eric Brown says that Amazon also carries Krylon camel paints. So if you're looking, if you can't find them in your local area, you can get them from Amazon. So that's cool. Um, let's see here. You can get nail polish, bottle shakers. Uh, might work well with mini paints too. Yeah, I could see that. That'd be kind of cool. Um, hello from Kentucky. Can confirm that both Rust-Oleum and Krylon camel paints work great for primers. I've not. I don't think I've used the Rust-Oleum, but the, 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 I've used mainly the, cry, the Krylon. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm generally pretty happy. If, I mean, like the black, if you are a person who primes just straight in black, the Krylon black could be your regular go-to primer. I think it works that well, specifically on plastic models, because the Krylon primer, the Krylon camo paints have their fusion technology in them, which is designed to stick to plastic very well. Um, but if you were going to be painting something like like I did my um, Plague Claw Catapult, I primed it and also base coated it in the dark brown. So now it's already wood color, and now I've made it dark brown. So I've basically saved myself a step. I didn't have to prime it and then base coat it. I did it at the same time. Um, skeletons, I do them in the lighter of the um, like sand colors. It's kind of like a bone color. I'm already two steps ahead. Well, one step ahead. 
So yeah, that's one of the reasons why I like those primers, and I think they work out really super well. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of those. Let's see here. Uh, Duralis says, I'm still waiting for the new dwarfs. Well, they, they had the Fire Slayers, but you're probably wondering, you probably want the ones that are not naked. So I, I understand what you're talking about here. Let's see here. Um, it's nice not see, not needing a set amount to start playing, says Alaskan MeTuber. Yeah, no, I agree. That's one of the things I do like about um, Age of Sigmar, and I think it's one of the things that they sort of planned on because it allows people to get into the hobby at a lower point of entry, which, you know, helps. What do you think of the new gem and metallic gloss washes? Actually, I haven't touched them yet. Um, for some reason, my local store hasn't picked them up yet uh, that I know of. To be fair, I haven't been in there all this week because I've been busy with work. But yeah, um, I know that Vince uh, Ventrella from, well, from his channel, uh, he does the Warhammer Wednesdays, Warhammer Weekly thing on Wednesdays. Um, I think he did a review or a, like a, you know, some sort of talk about them recently so that might be some place to look but I have not really had any experience with them yet so I don't know anything really much about them uh, let's see here oh I just realized that the air conditioning turned on which is gonna make a bunch of noise so I'm gonna fix that real quick here on my phone so pardon me while I that should fix it and the AC should go off in a couple of minutes um, it makes extra noise, and but we can I can control it from I can control the air conditioning from my phone, which is fancy, isn't it? Anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, it's five p.m. in Belgium. Sure, that makes sense. Hello from Denmark. Um, I had a really Alaskan MeTuber says I had a really bad experience with the Rustoleum primer. I was going to use a light bone color to prime base my Deathwing, and it came out chunky, so it made ten of my models textured like aged stone. No, you don't want that generally. Um, it's difficult, frankly, you know, rattle can priming I find to be sort of difficult. Sometimes I get a real dusty effect that I don't want. Depends if you're too far away from the models when you're spraying. Um, good the AC's off. Um, let's see. So yeah, too far away can make you a, make a very dusty kind of textured sort of surface. Um, sometimes bad humidity can do the same thing. Um, that's another reason why I moved to airbrush because it's almost never, I almost never have any problems with airbrush uh, priming. I, it's almost always very, very smooth. I have not had the problem that was mentioned earlier about it coming off. Um, I mean, it doesn't stick. Like if I took a toothpick or a toothbrush to it, I could probably, you know, make a bunch of it come off. But um, just in normal stuff, it doesn't seem to do that. Let's see. That was after a lot of can shaking and proper spraying technique. It could just be a bad batch too, you know. But again, humidity, temperature, all that kind of stuff. I've heard that people will frequently take like a big pot of water and heat it up to about like 90 degrees and then set the cans in there. Even if you're spraying outside on a relatively okay day that's not too cold, just to warm up the can and then bring it outside and then spray and then bring it back in and set it in the warm thing. I think that that's more work that I'm generally planning on doing, but um, yeah. I just bought the big army deal for Flesh Eater Counts. How would assemble the monstrous infantry? Crypt Horrors, non-flying, or Crypt Flayers, new flying variation? Um, I don't know, honestly. I don't like the look of the Crypt Horrors, and for me, that's kind of a big deal. You know what I mean? Like, they may be very effective in the game, but if I don't like the way they look, I'm like, meh. So maybe the flying ones, just because I think the wings are a little bit cooler um, from what I've seen, so yeah. George Hopkins says he's using the gem paints right now on a Wraith Knight. It's slow, but the effect is nice. Honestly, you know, things like the Wraith Knight, pretty much anything Eldar, that's what those gem paints are really designed for because, you know, you've got those gems all over everything that's Eldar. Um, so, yeah, that'll be interesting to see how those kind of start, how people start, you know, bringing those out. I need to, I guess, talk to Sam and see if he's had any experience with them yet um, when I see him on Tuesday. Let's see here. Controlling your AC via your phone. We have moved officially into the age of Jetsons. Uh, sorry, it's just the thermostat. It's uh, it's got it, it has Wi-Fi, so it's it's a thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. I like the green and the blue the most. Red is so so. I'm assuming we're talking about the gem stuff. Yeah, I should. I got to look into those more. I I like because I don't do anything Eldar and I don't really do anything that has gems on it generally. As far as these guys, you know, the 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 undead don't really get into jewelry too much. So I haven't. Um, 
I guess that's why I haven't looked into that stuff. Brew Geek asks, can you recommend a combo of a Krylon primer and wash that would be a good substitute for the Army Painter Necrotic Flesh Spray Primer? Hmm, well, the lightest of the green colors in the Krylon uh, camo is probably not as bright as Necrotic Flesh. So if I remember how bright Necrotic Flesh is, it's not as bright. So one thing you could do is rather than so you could you could use the lighter of the green colors which is going to be darker than you may want then you could maybe throw i don't know if you even use a wash at that point you might just instead then um dust it with another lighter color like an ivory uh if you could you know like with a rattle can or just dry brush a, a brighter green you know but not too bright green not like a neon green but like a you know, a pale green, you could dry brush that to do the highlighting instead of shading. Um, yeah, because the, the two green colors in that Krylon line are not nearly as bright as normal necrotic flesh, so I don't know that either of them. If you, if you wanted that as your base and then you just wanted to do washes and not do any highlighting, it wouldn't work. But if you wanted to do, um, you know, if you use the, the lighter of the green colors in the camouflage line and then dry brushed a lighter color over it in the highlight areas, tops of the you know, rotting heads and the shoulders and all that kind of jazz, then that might work. You can give that a try. I would test it a little bit, but yeah. Um, Joseph B says, I just tuned in. Is underpainting meaning that just painting in tone via grayscale, then applying thin layers of color uh, over top afterwards? Sort of, yes, basically. Um, it's basically kind of like you're making a black and white model, you know, with the shading and all that stuff, and then you're using um, thin glazes and things like that transparent paint colors to um to color that black and white photo kind of that you've made and um i mean some people use it with more opaque colors and then they just use this color as a guide to see where the highlights should be but i generally use the more transparent paint and it, i think it makes it look nicer so um Chris Dog says, I use P3 for plastic, but it might move to airbrushing it on. Uh, I know Sam is a big fan of P3 paints. I've not ever used any. I don't, there's no place around here that I think that sells them, sadly. I don't know where Sam got his from. Well, I think partially I know where Sam got his from. Partially Sam got his from two years ago at Gen Con, he won the P3 uh, Grandmaster um, paint comp competition. So he was like best of show at Gen Con for the P3 paint competition. And so he won like, I don't know, like three grand. Plus also, um, I think they sent him like all the P3 paints ever made or whatever, something like that. And, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I'm sure that's where he's getting a lot of his P3 paints still to this day. Um, but yeah, so he won that competition at Gen Con two years ago, the P P3 Grandmaster. And then last year, a uh, friend of the show, Tom Ailes, who you saw me interview back in 2014, like February, uh, he won the the p3 uh, grandmaster this back in 2015 gen con so um it'll be interesting to see who you know who wins it this year let's see here um i love the red gem paint for easy salamander space marine eyes oh yeah that'd be kind of cool yeah um gary says i was wondering if maybe i could use the gem paints to do the screwing pool the scrying pool hmm. on the coven throne well, yeah, I mean, unless it's supposed to be blood, then I don't know that the gem things would work as well for blood, because I don't think it's as dark, from what I understand. So, yeah, you know, you could do that. Um, Chris Dog says he's lucky his game shop sells P3 primer. I've heard people tell me that the P3 rattle can primer they like better than the GW rattle can primer. I've, I don't know that I've ever used either, because they've both always been really kind of expensive, and I've usually looked for other... Um, I mean, when I first started getting into miniature painting, the primer that I used was um, Sandable, Sandable uh, Automotive Primer. I went to like a local auto store and I bought, I think it was a company called Duracolor, something like that. And I would buy Sandable Auto Primer and it worked out great. Um, it was really nice stuff and it was like five bucks a can. Um, it doesn't come in tons of colors. It came basically in like black or gray. Although they did come in like a red oxide. And then I used that as the base color for my first Tau army. I would spray them this red oxide color. 
and then I would use an orange spray paint and then dust them from above and then it gave them this sort of again that kind of lit from above you know and then shadows underneath the arms and in between the legs and stuff like that because the shadows would get into the darker red oxide color and those worked out relatively well um, yeah so you know it's just basically a lot of experimentation but there's you know I talk about airbrush here because it's a great thing to use but it's not a necessity there's a lot of things you can still do with rattle can um, obviously if you live in an area that gets really cold in the winter it's much harder to prime and do stuff like that with rattle can unless you do it indoors but I don't like the smell of the propellant inside the house so that's why I don't do it that way and that's why the airbrush works out pretty well for me so anyway let's see here Briz Braz says, Hi Adam, hello from Scotland. First time catching the stream live. Big fan of the channel. It's given me lots of ideas and has encouraged me to actually get around to finishing off my second my second edition of 40k minis. Oh, well excellent. That's, you know, better better late than never, honestly. Um, and I bet you a lot of them are probably still, probably pretty usable still in uh, whatever, 7th seventh, seventh edition, which is what we're on right now. Soon to be 8th, I'm pretty sure. I keep saying it, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to see 8th edition late summer, sometime in the fall. Mark my words. I think I said it last episode, and I'll probably keep saying it until it happens. Let's see here. If you want good red, red, excuse me, if you want good blood paint, Tamaya Clear Red is for you. Yeah, that's the good stuff generally, from what I understand. I took a class two years ago at Adepticon about how to paint blood and pus and gore and stuff like that. Um, and it was one of the more expensive classes. Like a lot of times you'll go to a class and it's like six, seven bucks, but then there'll be classes that'll be 30 or $40, but that's because they're giving you a bunch of supplies as well. So this was like a $32 class, but we got a bunch of supplies. And one of the supplies that we got was to my clear red. It's, um, I don't think it's on. An, I don't think it's an acrylic. It might be an enamel, but it's glossy and it's still kind of transparent. But it's a darker red, but not maroon. And a lot of people like to use it for like blood splatter. So you'll put some maybe on a um, like on a toothbrush, and then you flick an old toothbrush. Don't use the toothbrush that you currently are using for your mouth. But then you kind of flick it, the the bristles that have got paint on them, and you splatter the stuff onto the model if you want the model to look like it was splattered with blood. Um, or if you just want like blood on the edge of a of an axe, you know, you want to put blood on the edge of this dude's axe, then you would, um, you know, once it's all painted and stuff like that, that'd be kind of a last step. Generally, you also do it. I would do it after I have sprayed the and sealed the model. Usually, one of the last steps you do in modeling, at least for me, is to use I use like to use uh, Tester's Dull Coat. Dull Coat is a a matte finish. Uh, clear spray and because it, it just makes the models matte which is not glossy um, but you sometimes will still have steps after that one of the steps is you might put down fl you know flock grass or static grass or tough grass you don't want to seal that stuff generally with um, with testers dull coat because it'll look weird so that's usually a last last step um, a potentially last, last, last step is going to be um, using stuff like the the Tamaya Clear Red because you still want it to look glossy, so it looks wet. So you've primed, you're not primed, you've sealed your model and made him look him or her look predominantly matte and flat and not glossy. And then you can go back and then flick it with some of the red to hopefully keep some of that glossy, fresh blood kind of look, which is cool. Another thing you'll do sometimes with Nurgle models is after I've used the dull coat on them to make them matte, I will then go back with a little bit of gloss, like brush on um, varnish, they call it. Uh, I think in GW they call it hard coat or hard coat or something like that. And um, use that gloss to like, like if he's got entrails hanging out, you paint the gloss on the entrails to make them look like they're wet. Or if you want to look you can do it on bases too. If you want it to look kind of like there's a little puddle in the dirt or in the mud, you can just blob a bunch of uh, the gloss coat in there and when it dries, it will look shiny and it'll look like it's always wet. So that's a way to do it. Question for the magnetizers. I want to use magnets for the wings of the Harbinger from Shadows of Brimstone. Which size would you recommend? Um, I'm not familiar with the model, so probably bigger ones. Wings are very hard to magnetize. I tried to magnetize my first 
uh, demon prince with his wings, and it did not work at all. So it's difficult. I have heard that you are better off stacking. So like maybe having two stacked um, magnets on the body and then maybe two stacked magnets on the inside of the wing if you can because they will kind of force multiply to some degree. Obviously they need to be the bright, you know, the poles need to be lined up properly and so they're not repelling each other because that'll suck. Um, but yeah, from what I understand, stacking sometimes can help to force magnify. Not necessarily times two, but it can help. So. Let's see here. Josiah, I have a question for, I guess, many people, different people in general in here that are 40K or Age of Sigmar players. Okay. What makes you want to play Age of Sigmar or 40K when there are so many other mini games out there now that are way more balanced and way less convoluted and backed by a better company and is cheaper? Um, that's a good question. You know, I mean, some people really like models. You know, they really like the specific models that, that you can get. Um, some people like the fact that because the game is popular, it's easier to find people to play against. You know, like you can go into a local store, like if you've moved to a new city, you can go to the local store and you're probably going to find people who play 40K or people who play like maybe Age of Sigmar, whereas a, a lesser known game, people might not play as much. Then the trick is, is that if you want people to play something like uh, Guild Ball or Malifaux, then you kind of have to become a little bit more of an advocate. Um, one of the nice things about those games is they have small model count, so it's not hard at all to bring enough stuff in for two players to play Malifaux. I've got a crew, you've got a crew, I brought in both crews, I brought in cards for both of us, I'll teach you how to play and maybe convince you. Um, that's much more difficult to do with 40k. I'm not going to bring in a 1500 point army for me and one for you and all that jazz. That's just really super difficult. So um, yeah, that kind of stuff is, I think, sometimes the, the, the case. Uh, let's see here. Um, people play Warhammer, not people play smaller indie games. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying there. Um, GW is 800 pound gorilla in the mini world. You can be pretty sure that if the game store sells minis, most of them will be GW. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's something to be said for that. That being said, I still enjoy games. I like love games like Frostgrave and Malifaux, and I'm interested in Guild Ball, though I haven't bought anything yet. Um, you know, so that kind of stuff I think is, I think that the, 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 the bigger well-known games, just like in music, you know, like when you're younger, you might be listening to like stuff that's popular and stuff that's on the radio and that kind of stuff. And as you get older, you might start to find yourself listening to more independent, more indie, more lesser known stuff frequently, not always, but frequently. And I think it's kind of the same thing when you get first into, you know, miniatures, it's what you see in the stores generally. Um, and then, you know, it, as you start to do more research and see things on the internet, you might be like, oh, well, this is really maybe more up my alley than, than say, Age of Sigmar or 40K or whatever. So, yeah. Uh, Daniel says, Ardcoat, the GW one. Yep, that's the one it's called. They change the names on the paints frequently, and I can't keep track of them anymore. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, test the orientation of the magnets before you glue them. That's what I'm talking about. If magnets are pole to pole, I don't know if it's north to north or south to south, they will repel each other violently sometimes. Uh, so you want to make sure that you get them lined up properly when you're trying to magnetize any kind of model. Make sure that they are actually attracting each other and not, you know, sending each other away. Uh, let's see here. Greetings, Adam. Listening in the rainy mountains of Wales, and also the first time I have caught this live. Normally play orcs, but having a, a time out and getting spanked today trying to paint Infinity. Yeah, I've got Infinity models in the basement. I haven't built... Well, I've built one. I haven't built any of the other ones yet. They are difficult builds, in my opinion. And um, so, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I still haven't completely decided on Infinity yet, though I've got friends locally that are starting to play it, which means I should probably at least... I mean, I did a demo with Sam a couple, I don't know, a couple months back. He showed me a demo, and we played a little bit at the local store uh, with stuff that he brought, and it didn't quite stick yet, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, let's see here. Josiah says, In my local store, nobody plays Warhammer, and everybody plays all the other minis games, such as Malifaux, Guild Ball, War Machine, Hordes, Wrath of Kings. Well, that's good. That's, you know, a lot of stores are obviously more GW heavy because they're the big, as someone mentioned earlier, 800 pound gorilla. Um, so, you know, it's, it's cool that you're, it's probably, if I had to make a guess, it's probably your store owner who's kind of steering that boat. 
as to you know maybe the store owner's like I don't want to I don't want to stock GW stuff because it's a pain in the rear or maybe they do but they don't push it as much and they push people more into the to the other lines uh, you know normally that's what's going to happen or else it's a couple of specific gamers alpha gamers as they're frequently known that kind of get people into other games and they could be the ones that are maybe more steering that boat so yeah but it's 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 cool Gerard says hi there I was thinking on changing my Skatari's jackets the cloaks thing sure from green to red do I need to completely strip them or should I paint over it it depends on how thick of a coat you all, well how thick of a paint coat you already have on their coats. Uh, if it's if you're not trying to win any awards and you didn't put it on there too thickly, you could try priming over it and then painting over it and going from there. Um, if you put it on pretty thick, uh, you may want to try to strip it. You don't necessarily have to completely strip it, like completely to the fact that there's none of the original color left, but stripping it somewhat could probably be pretty helpful. So. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Greetings, Adam. Oh, I heard, read that one. Uh, Alad says something about bolt action a bunch. Thanks for not spamming too much. Uh, let's see here. What's my favorite way of painting? Um, well, I generally like to, you know, do stuff like this and then kind of work in, like I said, an assembly line. Um, I think that's probably my favorite. Uh, I don't generally like to paint more than five models at once. If I have to paint like 10 or 20 you know, models at once, that becomes very daunting. So even though I have 50 some skeletons ready to go in the basement, I'm probably only gonna be doing them five or 10 at a time. I won't stick all of them on sticks probably. And well, I'll probably stick them all on sticks to start, but I'll only focus on five or a 10 at a time. Because if I have to paint like this guy's shield and then this guy's shield and then this guy's shield and do that for 50 skeletons, I will die probably. So if I do five or 10, and then tell, and then I get those guys finished, and then I go into the next five or ten and go from there. It will probably help me personally get through them that way. So, uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. You mentioned Frostgrave. Is it any good? I like it uh, quite a bit. It's it's a little bit like Mordheim. Um, some of the problems that I kind of have with Mordheim, it fixes, which I like. It also has a little bit of a. Um, it's got a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of an RPG aspect to it. Your normal soldiers, your normal war band of guys, they don't generally get any better. They're just henchmen, you know what I mean? They're just henchmen. But you have a, a wizard, and then you have an apprentice. And they kind of level up as you play. And so you can add new spells to them, and you can do things like that. And if the wizard gets killed eventually, like straight out just killed, you can then basically upgrade the apprentice and he's the new wizard and then you bring in a new apprentice and then kind of stuff and you're keeping track of like the money that you make if you're playing in more of a campaign thing it's a it's a neat system it's also an inexpensive book for like pretty high quality the models are cool they've made at least two plastic sets now i think they've started to make a third something to do with maybe hobgoblins or kobolds or something but they've got a, a soldier's kit which is great it's like 20 miniatures for $31 with tons of options. And they also make cultists, which are also really cool. So, um, yeah, I think that that's I think that's going to be kind of neat. Uh, why do GW change the name of the paint so frequently? Um, copyright. Like, the more they change the names to be stuff that only is something that they can... Because, you know, if they, call, if they called the, the blue Ultramarine... Well, ultramarine is not something they can copyright as a color because ultramarine has actually been around for hundreds and hundreds of years as a paint color. This is what I learned from from going to art school. Ultramarine is a specific color. So the fact that they called the ultramarines the ultramarines and they made them blue is actually kind of a, like a play on words. But then when Army Painter wants to make a color that's as close as possible to that color and call it ultramarine, they can do that. And then Games Workshop is like, well, now we got to come up with a different color uh, name because they don't. It's a it's a copyright thing. It's business. Otherwise, I don't know why they do that. Uh, let's see here. Do, do 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 do. Adam, do you use a definition filter on your models, aka uh, interactive uniform glazes? Not generally. I have known to use the parchment wash from Games Workshop, or I'm sorry, not Games Workshop, from Secret Weapon uh, Miniatures, I'll use the parchment color, which is like a, a kind of a bleached bone sort of color. If I want a piece of terrain or something to look sand 
or not sand, uh, sun bleached kind of. You use that more as a final step and it works pretty well for that and kind of acts like a filter. A filter in painting, for those of you that don't know, is um, it's like a it's like a it's kind of like another glaze, but it's designed to sort of either flatten all the colors down to make it look like it's been sitting outside for a long time, um, you know, or you can it, it yeah it's kind of designed like that. Um, sometimes you use them on statues that sit outside a lot, uh, like a military vehicle. If you were like military modelers who do that, you know, they they use a lot of filters to make things look like that sun bleached kind of color works out pretty well. Um, Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Adam, do you prefer historical or fantasy sci-fi models? Um, a little bit of both. Lately, I've been on a very, his, not historical, but more fantasy kick, uh, definitely. I used to be a lot more sci-fi. I've been more into fantasy lately, uh, the last year or so, maybe more. I'm not sure exactly why that changed, but uh, yeah, I have been. Uh, Uncommon asks, why you have glasses? I think because my eyes aren't really good so these help me to see better so that I can see that's why I have glasses um oh right no uh, Azurite says it's Superman uh, and the glasses are just a disguise that's actually not the case I, I cannot fly uh, let's see here do, 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 do. Alaskan MeTuber asks so what was your first model or what was the thing that got you into the sickness that we call model collecting and painting uh, Space Hulk Space Hulk, when I was in, well, yes, Space Hulk, when I was in college in the early 90s, a friend of mine had first edition Space Hulk and showed me the game, and we played uh, down in the basement in the dorm that he lived in, and I was, you know, we were playing and having a good time, but I was also flipping through the book that came with it, it was this little thin paper black and white book, but it had a bunch of fluff in there from Games Workshop about the Emperor and you know, and, and heretics, and, and the, the you know the you know the mutants and the unclean and all this kind of crazy stuff. And I was like, this is kind of really cool. So honestly, it's, for me, Space Hulk back in the early '90s got me into it. And then I moved into BattleTech for a while, and I painted BattleTech miniatures with testers enamels, those little square glass jars that you paint like model airplanes and model cars with, or used to. Um, oh, they looked terrible. They were so bad. Uh, those models. Um, so yeah, I did Battletech for a while, and then then I didn't do much in the way of tabletop gaming for quite some time, and I played video games for quite a while, and then I started getting back into tabletop gaming late 90s, uh, early 2000s, and then I started painting a lot and doing a lot of stuff, and so it's been really since then that I've gotten back into it, but I first got started with, like I said, original first edition Space Hulk, you know, that... I think it's a great gateway game. Any kind of those games that's like a board game, but also like a miniatures game, I think it's a great gateway game. Um, hmm. Hey, Mo hey, Adam, I was wondering what your favorite model is you've ever seen and what you like about it, uh, the sculpt and the color scheme. Hmm, that's a good question. I'm really looking forward to... I bought a Glotkin model, and I think that the Glotkin is amazing looking. Um... And I really want to put it together and paint it and, and go all that stri direction, but I know it's going to take an astounding amount of time, and I know that I'm nervous about doing it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I talk a good game. I, I do that video about, you know, well, don't worry about perfection. And that's fine when you're painting skeletons or even when you're painting smallish guys like this, but when you're painting a model, I mean, that thing costs like 80 or 90 bucks, and it's like a, nearly a foot tall. <sighs> yeah. I don't want to like goof it up, you know what I mean? So that's that's kind of a trick right there. Uh, let's see here. I was going to say Frostgrave is RPG oriented and tells a story. To some degree, yeah. I mean, you can definitely it's definitely designed to be played in a campaign setting where you play, you know, a series of games with a friend and you go back and forth that way. So I think that's really cool. Uh, have you thought about taking your shirt off in your videos? It might be a good way to get more girls interested in wargaming. I do not believe that that would help. Not even a little bit. Nope, I don't think it would. Uh, let's see here. What's my favorite army in Age of Sigmar? Uh, it's a toss-up right now, actually, between, um, you know, Chaos slash Nurgle and uh, uh, Death. That's kind of those where I'm at right now. So... Are you planning on joining joining in the big Age of Sigmar summer campaign that GW is launching? Um, I haven't. I've heard that it's launching. I haven't heard much of the details yet. 
if it is only playable or if you can only do it at GW stores, then no, because it would be an hour and a half drive for me to get to my closest, at least an hour and a half drive to get to my closest GW store. So yeah, then that's not the case. If it's something that you can do in pretty much any store, well, then maybe. But uh, if it's only at GW stores, then eh, that's not going to work out for me. Uh, let's see here. I have a feeling Adam ignores me due to him suspecting that I am a Vikings fan. I, I'm, uh, I'm not a sports fan. My wife might ignore you because she's a Packer fan. Because she's, she's a big Packer fan. I, 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 I apologize if I've been ignoring you. I hope I'm not. Um, but it's not because you're a Vikings fan. I don't really get into sports, so. Uh, does Secret Weapon make a basic color wash multi-pack that I can get? I don't know if they make... Well, A, I don't know what you, exactly what you mean by basic. They do make they do make some color packs, I think. Like, you can buy the entire line, boom, or you can buy them singularly. I know those two things for sure. I don't know if they've got other, out, you know, breakouts of, like, these are just dark colors or these are just, like, you know, bright colors or whatever. I would look on their website, but um, they're 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 cool. I like the their washes quite a bit. Uh, let's see here, Adam. I'm German. Following English is not the best. Sorry, I don't. I can't speak any German, frankly. Um, what do you say about people who think they have to paint the best models and get crazy with that? Well, that's kind of what I was just talking about. Um, perfection can really trying to reach perfection can really slow you down, and specifically for tabletop stuff for stuff that you're going to game with just get it done don't don't sit there and be like yeah but that the hilt on that sword is just not quite where i want it to be highlighted you know you just get it done and then paint like i said i'm i'm nervous about glotkin because he's so big um but <laughs> you know it's one of those situations where i'm trying to i need to get working on him but i've got also a ton of other skeletons those skeletons i'm going to power through as quick as possible i'm not going to try to focus too hard on making each one perfect because yeah it'll just take forever so uh what is glotkin fluff wise um he is or well yeah i think it's a he glotkin is a big huge guy his name is something there it's the reason they're called glotkin there's actually three of them they are brothers aka kin so there's two Glot brothers on top, and they are riding the humongous third Glot brother. So it's beyond that. I don't know much of the fluff, but from what I understand, there's like a more of a melee guy. There's more of a wizardy guy, and then they're riding their other brother, who is humongous. So that's really interesting. Guild Ball has been the best game for me to get players into miniatures that have never played miniatures before. The price point is amazing, and the rules are so easy to explain and teach and get. I played a demo of it uh, beginning of um, sometime in March or no May sometime in May I was at an event and I played my first demo of it and I talked a little bit to some of the guys from Steamforged actually because they were at the event so that was cool um, and I'm kind of interested I've been looking actually at some of the forces to figure out not like how they play but like oh I think those guys look cool and I think these guys don't look cool or whatever so I've been doing some of that and uh, I'm looking forward to maybe getting into the game. We'll see how it goes. Again, it's going to be something I'm going to have to pull people kicking and streaming in my area into. So, um, Hey, Adam, struggling with the sudden death rule. Does the third more models mean only at the setup or when summoning? From what I understand, it's at the setup. That's the way I understand it to be the case. It'll be interesting. I don't know. Have they released? Have they completely released the fact yet? I know they put the fact on Facebook for to get more feedback, but I don't know if it's like a hundred percent yet. Uh, you should take a look on the GW site and see if it is. That's I haven't looked lately actually. Um, let's see here. Do you get intimidated before painting large models? I have a GW smog that has been unbuilt and semi-painted for at least a year. Don't know how to get started. Uh, as it turns out, yeah, with big models, sometimes I do get a bit intimidated, especially when I like them a lot. Um, yeah, so. That's something that I'm I'm trying to you know overcome, but it's going to maybe take me a little bit of while, a little, a little bit of time. Um, let's see. Have you tried any of the new box games from GW recently? Silver Tower, or Lost Patrol. I have not. Uh, I saw some Lost Tower played for like about a minute at that event that I went to in Madison back in May, but I haven't really. I don't know anybody that plays it right now, so I haven't got a chance to take a look at it much. Let's see here. Um, Lost Patrol does sound interesting. Yeah, I haven't. I've seen actually less of that, frankly. So I should probably look around online. Robbie says, "Hey, Adam, I just got back into painting figures from 20 years ago. Your YouTube videos really helped me get back into it. What do you spray on your figures when you are done to preserve them?" I like Testers Dull Coat. 
Um, it's my favorite, and I use that. It smells terrible, so you want to do it outside, but Tester's Dull Coat makes a nice, flat surface. It's a little expensive. It comes in a pretty small can for usually about five bucks, but it's it works pretty well. You don't have to put it on too thick. Actually, if you put it on too thick, it will not be as matte. It will be, end up being more glossy. Too many layers will make it glossier, so don't do that. Just you know, dust it on there and then don't touch your models a ton. You know, you don't have to not touch them, but you know, you just understand that over time, the more you touch them, especially if you haven't like varnished them at all, you could, you know, affect the way that the paint looks. So I know this feeling well. I have an Imperial Knight that I've been putting off. It is such a large project. However, my personal best advice would be to start in smaller increments. Yeah. I've always kind of wanted to paint an Imperial Knight, even though I don't play 40k anymore. I think they're neat, but um yeah, that would be another be another be another big project to kind of tackle. Let's see here. Um, what do you think about the situation GW is currently in? Financial fans who are disappointed, employees going away. I think they're trying to turn it around. Um, the changes that I've seen them doing online, the changes I've seen them doing in you know just in social media and things like that, um, announcing things more than a week in advance here and there. I think that that's them trying to make a change because they realize it needs to happen, um, which is a good step because in the past it's needed to happen for quite some time and they just haven't realized it or they've just ignored it. And I think now they're paying more attention. So um, yeah, so we'll hopefully hopefully we'll see some, some benefit from that. Armor Freak asks, will you be getting into War Machine Mark III? I don't know. I was interested. One of the reasons I did that streamlined video just recently was because I had been told at this event I went to in Madison that it was very streamlined in comparison to the older. And I'd played Mark II a little bit, and I was kind of like, eh, I'm not sure. Well, I've talked to some people, one of them being Codex Dan, who's well known for his um, War Machine, you know, uh, playing and, and a love of War Machine. And he recently commented in one of my videos and was like, well, it's not that streamlined. They like kind of simplified some stuff here and there, but it's kind of the same. So I don't know. I'd like to maybe see a demo again um, and maybe like talk to some people who are kind of veterans and ask them some questions. The models have never really spoken to me. I was kind of interested in Kador for quite a while, but I don't know. One of the things that bothered me about War Machine and has for quite some time is the fact that actually bringing War Machines in your in your army is not super helpful. You mostly bring troops. So uh, I don't didn't want to paint troops. I wanted big, cool, steam-powered robots. Well, from what I understand, Mark III has changed things so that allegedly the actual War Machines themselves, the Jacks, are more useful. And so I'll that'll be interesting because if I could play, you know with more war jacks and less troops, I'd kind of dig that. So we'll see how it goes. Um, let's see here. Next question. Do you like Forge World stuff already? And what do you think about Death Core of Krieg? Uh, I don't know much of Death Core of Krieg at all. I know what they look like. I think they're cool looking models, but I don't know much about their lore or the rules or anything like that, sadly. Um, I've messed a little bit with some Forge World here and there. It's mainly been bits and parts. I don't know if I've ever built a complete more Forge World model. So I know the resin is nicer than Finecast, so you know, that's a benefit. Um, Admiral Piat says, Hi Adam, I'm fairly new in miniature painting. I paint an elven warrior right now and plan to gift her to a friend who loves elves. Is dry brushing a good way to highlight hair? Yeah, I mean, you want to be subtle, especially with something like an elf. One of the reasons that I generally, myself personally, don't ever paint like elves and things like that is because they have to look so clean and so kind of beautiful. And I like things that look a little grungier, you know? I like things that look like they've been living in a, in a, in a, in a pile of dirt uh, or in a, in a graveyard just because it, it matches my paint style better. So if you're going to highlight hair, dry brushing is good, but you need to be pretty subtle about it so that it's not, you know, like gloppy, basically. That's a technical term. Uh, what's the worst model you had to put together? Mm, actually, the worst model that I ever had to put together, I just put together recently, it was a piece of terrain for Age of Sigmar. It was the Ophidian Gates or something like that. It was just warped, just really badly warped. Like it, it took a lot of glue and clamps and still there's a lot of gaps in it. And I'm just like, well, it's a piece of terrain. It's good enough. Um, I'm not going to fill that part in with, with with green stuff, but yeah, that's honestly one of the worst models that I've built in quite some time. It's just, I mean, it's a brand new kit that they just put out, but those models are, the, the, the stuff that came out is just warped. It's not the standard plastic that they used to use in their terrain, 
it's I don't know what it is, but it's not the same plastic, and it's 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 not great. So I've not been super happy with that new piece of terrain for uh, Age of Sigmar. Uh, let's see here. What is streamlining? Um, I had some people ask me about what streamlining means because they're not English speakers, you know, as a, as an initial language, which is understandable. So streamlining, um, it. Basically, streamlining in physics, from what I understand, is to pull parts off of something that you were trying to get to go through, let's say, water or air. If you have an airplane that has a big, giant, flat thing on the front, that will not be streamlined because the air will hit it and then make a bunch of turbulence. So you want things to be smooth. Airplanes are smooth. The bottoms of boats are smooth. If there was a bunch of weird junk sticking off the bottom of your boat, it would not go through the water as quickly. That's streamlining. Using streamlining in gaming is when you take a rule set and the and you pull off some of the parts that take a lot of extra time and don't necessarily give you any added benefit. So it's it's kind of smoothing things down so you can play quicker, you can play easier, um, that kind of stuff. And you're seeing companies do that more and more, streamlining their games, because um, if a game is too obtuse, if a game is too difficult, if it's hard to learn newer players will just ignore it. They'll be like, well, I was interested in that because I thought the cover of the box was cool, but then I played a demo and it's really hard and there's tons of math and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And there are obviously people out there who like those types of games, but generally beginners don't. They want something that's a little bit more easy to grasp and then go from there. So um, that's why you're seeing a lot of different companies. Whenever there's a new version, one of the big keywords they always say is like, oh, we're streamlining the rules. And that means that they're trying to pull out the stuff that slows things down. Some people don't like that, but a lot of people especially people who are trying to get into the hobby, have a tendency to, to enjoy that more. So that's what streamlining means. I understand that, yeah, for people who are, you know, English as a second language and that kind of stuff, streamlining as a term may not necessarily make as much sense, but that's basically where it comes from. Uh, Megaboss Champa says, hi. Hi. Uh, let's see here. In Mark Three, Josiah says, in, in Mark Three, this is War Machine, you'll be doing more jacks only because you have to because your Warcaster or Warlock have more beast points now. You will see, you will still see close to or the same amount of troops, though, I believe. Well, okay. That's good to know. Um, Armor Freak says, the rules for Mark Three are up for free already. The new unit cards drop in nine days, I think. But yeah, after reading the rules, they have made it so you want to run more stompy robots and beasts in Mark III. Well, that's that's good to hear. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. Josiah says, I do like a lot of the new changes for Mark III. Again, War Machine. I'm definitely going to give it a try again on the table since I bought into it heavily in Mark II and then barely played it because some of the rules in list building. Yeah, that was the same here. Um, I Actually... One of my, the last game that I played of Mark II, I played against Sam, and he was Troll Bloods, and they have that toughness roll where you can kill them, and then if they roll a five or six, they just don't die. That was disheartening. Uh, so um, that was one of the last times that I played, actually. Let's see here. Um, so it looks like Josiah and Armor Freak are talking a lot about more Machine, which is cool. Um, the Grot Boss... Uh, General Skibo says, Grot Big Boss on Gigantic Spider was a pain in the ass to put together. I'm assuming that's what PETA means. <laughs> Last fine cast I ever touch. Yeah, a big fine cast model? I do not want, generally. Um, I do have the Nurgle Demon Prince, who is a big-ish model, and he's fine cast. But again, Nurgle fine cast it kind of doesn't matter because Nurgle's all bumpy and pitted anyway, so it makes perfect sense for fine cast. But a big, like, other type of model that's not Nurgle, I would probably not be super interested in. So, yeah, I can, I totally, I feel your pain there. Um, uh, let's see here. Just tuned in. What's going on? Is there no 40K? Um, the, well, we talked a bit about 40K. We talked about a bunch of things, but um, it is actually... About time for me to sign off. It's 11 o'clock here in uh, where I am, and we've been talking for two hours. So um, I do need to go do Father's Day stuff. I'm not a father, but I have a father and a father-in-law, so we'll be doing that stuff. And um, I'll be back here in two weeks on uh, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Central, until 11 a.m. Central. 
So not this upcoming Sunday, but the Sunday after that. It's the Every Other Sunday show. And uh, I appreciate everybody who um, had questions and uh, listened to me ramble and, and looked at my uh, death people and stuff and all that kind of stuff. Maybe in two weeks you'll see these guys with some color on them or you'll see some other project. But my plan is going forward is to have a short little, hey, I'm going to talk about this thing for a bit. So there's a subject, but a lot of it's going to be what I'm doing here with the, the answering questions and things like that. So um, that's pretty much everything we've got going. So I hope everybody has a good rest of the day and um, keep watching the videos. Thanks for watching. I always appreciate when people watch the videos. I hope you enjoy them. Thanks for commenting. And um, that's pretty much about it. So um, I will definitely say uh, hi to the cats. They're not being noisy today, so that's kind of nice actually. But all right, that's pretty much it. And now I'm trying to figure out how to turn this off. I don't remember how.